Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Das Science and today we're going to talk about orbital angular momentum in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. In classical physics, angular momentum is a rotational equivalent of linear momentum and therefore we find it everywhere in systems with rotational motion. The analogous quantity in quantum mechanics is orbital angular momentum, and again we find it everywhere in systems such as the hydrogen atom. However, in quantum mechanics, angular momentum is an operator, and we need to decide which representation we want to write it in before we can do anything with it. As orbital angular momentum describes the motion of particles, you will not be surprised to know that we normally want to work in the position representation. So what we will do today is to derive expressions for the different angular momentum operators in the position representation. So let's go! Orbital angular momentum is a quantity that we're all familiar with from classical mechanics. To visualize it, let's start with a reference point, and let's also consider a vertical axis going through that point. If we have a particle here at position r, moving with momentum p, and let's imagine that it's going around in a circle, then the orbital angular momentum vector l is just the cross product between r and p. Keep in mind that this is a general definition, so this diagram here is just a simple example. Spelling out the position vector in Cartesian coordinates x, y, z, and the momentum vector in terms of px, py, and pz, we then label the angular momentum components lx, ly, and lz, and by carrying out this cross product, we find that lx equals this, ly equals this, and Lz equals this. Now, from the introductory video on angular momentum, which you can find linked in the description, we know that orbital angular momentum in quantum mechanics arises by simply promoting the classical quantities to the corresponding operators. And that means that we can write Lx as equal to Ypz minus Zpy, and similarly for Ly and for Lz. We don't need to worry about the order of the products because they all contain position and momenta along different Cartesian axes, which means that they all commute. Whenever we solve a quantum problem, the very first step is to decide in which basis or representation we must describe relevant quantities such as operators. As orbital angular momentum describes the motion of particles in 3D space, as shown up here, then the most useful representation is the position representation. Now, we want to write the angular momentum operators in the position representation, and for that all we really need to know is how to write the position and momentum operators in the position representation. We actually already know how to do this, because we covered it in the video called Position and Momentum. And if you haven't watched it yet, make sure you check the link in the description, because it'll be really useful. What you need to know is that the position operator R is made of these three position operators X, Y, and Z. And when working in the position representation, all it does is multiply the wave function by the components X, Y, and Z. Similarly, the momentum operator P is made of these three components, and in the position representation, momentum acts by calculating the gradient of the wave function, as indicated by this term, all multiplied by minus i h bar. So what does this imply for the angular momentum? Let's start with Lx and consider its action on a state psi. And from this expression up here, we know that this is equal to ypz minus zpy acting on psi. Using the expressions of the position and momentum operators in the position representation, we get minus ih bar y partial derivative with respect to z, minus z partial derivative with respect to y, all acting on the wave function psi r. This means that we can write down the operator Lx in the position basis as equal to this differential operator. As you can imagine, we can do the exact same thing for Ly and also for Lz. And that's it. These are the angular momentum operators in the position representation, with a small caveat. A lot of the time, it is actually more convenient to work in spherical coordinates rather than Cartesian coordinates. 
So what I want to do in the rest of the video is to rewrite these expressions for Lx, Ly and Lz in spherical coordinates, a process that is utterly tedious, but really necessary. It's almost like a rite of passage. All of us have to do it once in our lives, just so we never have to do it again. So before we start, let's refresh the theory behind different coordinate systems. We've already seen Cartesian coordinates. So if we consider a set of coordinate axes, a general point of position R is given by the x, y, z coordinates, each of which represents a length. To obtain these coordinates, we first project onto the horizontal plane, and then get the x coordinate along the first axis, and the y coordinate along the second axis. For the third coordinate, we first project onto this plane, and then onto the third axis. And the values of x, y, and z can be any real number. Now how about spherical coordinates? Let's set up a new set of coordinate axes and the same point at R. In spherical coordinates, we now describe the position of the point with a different set of three numbers, a length R and two angles theta and phi. The first is the distance between the origin and the point P, which is the magnitude of the vector R, and we call it scalar R. The second is the angle between the vector r and the third axis, and we call it the polar angle and label it with theta. And the third is built by first projecting the vector r onto the horizontal plane, and then measuring its angle with respect to the first axis, and we call it the azimuthal angle and label it with phi. As r is the length of a vector, it can only be zero or positive. The polar angle theta runs from 0 to pi, and the azimuthal angle phi from 0 to 2 pi. To transform between these two sets of coordinates, we need the mathematical relation. We find that x is equal to r sine theta cos phi, y is equal to this, and z is equal to this. Now going the other way, we have that r is the length of the vector r, Theta is the inverse cosine of z over r, which I am spelling out in Cartesian coordinates. And phi is the inverse tangent of y over x. At this point, it's actually critical to highlight that I am using the so-called physics convention. Mathematicians typically use a different convention, where they exchange the definitions of theta and phi. So we all have to be very careful to make sure that we are aware of the convention that is being used when we consult the literature. From these relations, we can transform any quantity we want between Cartesian and spherical coordinates, and in a moment we will see how to do this for the angular momentum components. Most of you will have encountered spherical coordinates before, but if you haven't, you can find more details in most introductory mathematics textbooks. Okay, so once we have the relations between Cartesian and spherical coordinates, transforming expressions such as those for the angular momentum components between the two is in principle straightforward. In practice though, the required mathematical manipulations turn out to be somewhat long, so I will not do the whole thing. Instead, I will show you how to transform Lz, and you can try doing Lx and Ly yourselves. So we figured out a moment ago that Lz is given by this expression. We can straight away transform the x here to spherical coordinates using this expression, and the y here using this expression. The trickier quantities to transform are these two partial derivatives here and here. The first is the partial derivative with respect to y. Using the chain rule for partial derivatives, we can write it as the partial derivative of r with respect to y times the partial derivative with respect to r, and then the same for theta and the same for phi. So the quantities we need to evaluate to complete the transformation are the partial derivative of r with respect to y, partial derivative of theta with respect to y, and partial derivative of phi with respect to y. Similarly, if we look at the other required partial derivative with respect to x, we get these three terms. 
Unsurprisingly, we now need the partial derivatives of the spherical variables with respect to x. So how do we figure out the required partial derivatives? There are actually multiple ways of doing this, and what I will do in the following is just one possible approach. Let's start by writing the transformation of the partial derivative with respect to y again. We first need the partial derivative of r with respect to y. So for this, let's pick this expression, and actually we're going to use its square. We now calculate the partial derivative with respect to y of both sides. The left-hand side gives 2r times the partial derivative of r with respect to y and the right-hand side gives 2y. We can now isolate the partial derivative of r with respect to y, and using the expression for y in spherical coordinates here, we get this. We can now simplify to sine theta sine phi. And we can now insert this expression for the partial derivative of r with respect to y in the first term above, and we get sine theta sine phi times the partial derivative with respect to r. OK, let's make some room. The second quantity we need is the partial derivative of theta with respect to y. For this, let's pick this expression, and actually we will use its cosine. And we now calculate the partial derivative with respect to y of both sides. The left-hand side gives minus sine theta times the partial derivative of theta with respect to y, and the right-hand side gives z times the partial derivative of 1 over r. Let's look at this partial derivative. We can rewrite 1 over r in terms of Cartesian coordinates. We can now take the partial derivative with respect to y, and reintroducing r, we get this. Now, going back up here, we can now isolate the partial derivative of theta with respect to y, and it gives z times y over r cubed sine theta. Using these expressions for z and y, we get the partial derivative of theta with respect to y equals this. And simplifying, we get cos theta sine phi over r. We can now insert this expression for the partial derivative of theta with respect to y in the second term above, and we get plus cos theta sine phi over r times the partial derivative with respect to theta. And let's make some room for the final term. The final quantity that we need is the partial derivative of phi with respect to y. For this, let's pick this expression, and actually we will use its tangent, and we will calculate the partial derivative with respect to y of both sides again. The left-hand side gives 1 over cos squared phi times the partial derivative of phi with respect to y, and the right-hand side gives 1 over x. Isolating the partial derivative of phi with respect to y, we get this. And we can now use the expression for x here to rewrite this expression like this. Simplifying, we get cos phi divided by r sine theta. We can now insert this expression for the partial derivative of phi with respect to y in the third term above, and we get plus cos phi over r sine theta times the partial derivative with respect to phi. So let's write again the final expression that we got for the partial derivative with respect to y transformed into spherical coordinates. We could take an analogous strategy to transform the partial derivative with respect to x, and this is what the final expression looks like in spherical coordinates. With these results, we're now finally ready to go back to considering Lz, which in Cartesian coordinates is given by these two terms. We now want Lz in spherical coordinates, so we start with minus ih bar, and then open a big bracket. The first term is x, and using the expression up here, we write it like this. Then we need the partial derivative with respect to y, which we just figured out here, and we can write like this. Then we need y, which is up here, and gives this. 
And finally, we need the partial derivative with respect to x, which I just claimed is given by this expression. That gives this. All I've done is to copy the expressions we just derived in the correct place, but feel free to pause for a moment to make sure that you're convinced by this step. Taking into account the two terms here and here that multiply the brackets, we find that this term cancels with this term and this term cancels with this other one. Now, this term combines with this one, and if we don't forget the terms multiplying before the bracket, we get minus ih bar times cos squared phi plus sine squared phi times the partial derivative with respect to phi. This term is simply 1. So this whole thing simplifies to minus ih bar times the partial derivative with respect to phi. And we got there. As anticipated, the derivation is tedious, but the final result is rather neat. The LZ operator in spherical coordinates is given by this simple expression. As you can imagine, what we need to do is repeat the derivation for LZ for all of the other relevant angular momentum operators to figure out what they look like when they are written in spherical coordinates within the position representation. The example of LZ that we just covered shows what these calculations involve, and although they do not present any conceptual challenges, they are rather long. What I have here is the results for the other quantities. This is the LX operator in the position representation written in spherical coordinates, and this is the LY operator. This, of course, is just the expression for LZ that we have just derived. Calculating LX and LY is really quite similar to what we just did for LZ, and I think it is actually good practice to do the explicit calculations at least once, as I was saying earlier, so I really encourage you to try them out. Conveniently, we can also use these results to figure out how to write L squared and the ladder operators in the position representation. All we need to do is plug in the corresponding expressions for LX, LY and LZ in their definitions. So for L squared, which is defined like this, this is the final result, whereas this is the expression for the raising operator, and this one is for the lowering operator. Moving forward in our study of orbital angular momentum, we're going to use all of these results, so an easy way to keep them handy would be for you to just copy them down or take a screenshot. These derivations can be a little tedious, but it's really important that we do them because once we have the final expressions, they can really simplify our life further down the line. For example, the expressions for the orbital angular momentum in spherical coordinates that we've just derived feature everywhere in the study of hydrogen atoms. So as always, if you liked the video, please subscribe.